Hey, good afternoon. My name is Jason, and I'm going to talk to you about measuring species diversity. So what's this all about? What's the problem here? Let's suppose you have a region, and you've counted all the species in the region, and you've also measured the proportion in which each of the species occurs. So you write this down as a probability vector, p1 to pn. You have n species, and you know each of the proportions for each of the species. So the problem is to define a way to measure the biological diversity of this region. The most and perhaps easiest way to do it is to use the species richness, or simply count the number of species that you have in the region. And this can be defined in this formula. It's the sum from i equals 1 to n of pi to the 0. In other words, you're just counting the number of species in the region. And of course, you use the convention that 0 to the power of 0 is 1. Okay, so Let's see an example. Let's suppose you have a region with three equally distributed species and another region with four equally distributed species. Then the richness of the first region is three and the richness of the second region is four. You're just counting the number of species, completely ignoring the proportion information that you've gathered. And of course, this leads to a problem. What's the problem? So we let uh, v1 and v2 be these vectors. We have two more regions here. The first region has three species equally distributed. The second region now also has three species, but the three species in the second region are unequally distributed, with the first one being relatively rare, occurring with a proportion of 1 over 20, and the second and third species occur roughly equally. So the species richness of, this, of these two places are just both three, because we're only counting the number of species, and we've ignored the proportion information in the second vector, which says that the first species is relatively rare. So you might expect that in the second region, the biological diversity has decreased. So the first solution to this problem is called Shannon entropy. Let's suppose you have a probability vector, p1 to pn. The Shannon entropy of this vector is defined as the sum of i equals 1 to n of the probability at, of species i, or the proportion of species i, times a log of 1 over that proportion. And this, this measure is actually a very famous measure, and it's used in information theory. And again, we have the convention that a term is 0 if pi is equal to 0. So if pi is equal to 0, then that term, the sum, is equal to 0. The Shannon entropy satisfies the following properties. First, if there's only one species and you have the other species being not there, then the Shannon entropy of that situation, of that distribution, is zero. And that, that goes back to the information theoretic perspective, because it's saying that if you know exactly that you're always going to encounter just one species, then there's really no entropy, there's no uncertainty in your sampling process. And that's a minimum that this function occurs. And the second is that the, the Shannon entropy is maximized exactly when the distribution is uniform. Information theoretically that can be interpreted as saying that the Shannon entropy is maximized when you cannot predict what's going to happen. All possibilities occur equally. And, and in which case the maximum is, is the log of n. So let's compute the Shannon entropy back with our two vectors, one where, where the first situation is three species equally distributed, and the second situation is three species very unequally distributed. So again, just to remind you that the species richness in these both cases is three, but with Shannon entropy, the diversity of the first is log three, which is 1.0986 approximately, and the Shannon entropy of the second is 0.8556. So now the Shannon entropy we've seen has captured the idea that the diversity has decreased. In information theoretically, that makes sense, right? In the second example, you know you're, it's very unlikely to encounter the first species. So in other words, the entropy of the situation has decreased. So actually, we can say that in some cases, or perhaps in, in some way, it's better to have more entropy rather than less. What is the problem with Shannon entropy? And you can see a problem with Shannon entropy in the following example. Let's suppose we have a planet with 1,000 equally distributed species. Okay, well then the Shannon diversity is log 1,000, which is 6.91. And of course, I probably should have mentioned earlier that we're using the natural logarithm, but since we're all mathematicians here, the only logarithm, the true logarithm, is the natural logarithm. So the Shannon diversity of the situation is 6.91. 
But now let's suppose on our planet we have a disaster, some kind of crazy disaster like humanity, and now there are only 500 species left, still equally distributed. In this case, the Shannon diversity is log 500, which is 6.21. So although we only have half the number of species, the Shannon diversity did not decrease by a very large number. And there's a way to fix this actually, and it's called the effective number transformation. So let's suppose again we have a probability distribution on a finite set P1 to Pn that represents the proportion of species, of n species in an area. We can ask the question, how many equally distributed species are required to give the same diversity measure as the Shannon entropy? So we want to solve for n in the following equation. And here we're asking, what is the value of capital N such that log capital N is equal to the Shannon entropy of the given situation? This gives you a new function on the set of all probability distributions, and in turn it gives you a transformation that takes a measure m, a, di a diversity measure m, and sends it to an effect, something called the effective measure, the m effective measure. And we can do this, and you may have already guessed how to do this for the Shannon entropy, but this is a general procedure. It doesn't just apply to Shannon entropy. But for Shannon entropy, to solve for n in this equation is simply taking the exponential of the Shannon entropy. And that gives uh, the following with our previous example. Now the effective Shannon entropy of our 1,000 species planet is 1,000, but when 500 species go extinct, still equally distributed, we now have the effective Shannon entropy as 500, so the diversity was divided in half when the number of species was divided in half. Okay, so let's go back again to our example of three species in one region equally distributed and another region unequally distributed. Then we've got the species richness, of course, is still three, three species in both regions, but with the effective Shannon entropy now, we've got three, the measure of three for the first region, and the effective Shannon entropy for the second region is now 2.3. So you see now the unequal distribution has given a much greater difference between the two numbers. You've got a difference of about 0.7, whereas before the difference was about 0.2. So here's an exercise. There's another measure of diversity called the Gini Simpson index, and it's defined by this following equation. 1 minus the sum over the square of all pi's. And I want you to show that first, the Gini Simpson index, GS, measures the probability that two random draws from the finite set of species will result in the same species. And the second exercise, which is related to the effective transformation index, is that the effective transformation of the Gini Simpson index is 1 over the sum of the square of the pi's. So what is the problem with the effective numbers so far? Well, let's consider another example. Let's suppose we have three different regions. Here we have a region with four species, all equally distributed. The next V2, the next region, now they're no longer equally distributed. The third and the fourth species have been reduced to being very rare. And the first species is the most common one. And the second one is, is, is also kind of rare, I guess. But in the third situation, described by the vector v3, now the third and the fourth species have gone extinct. So what happens here if you're trying to measure this situation with the effective Shannon entropy? Well, you can compute that the effective entropy, the effective Shannon entropy of the first situation is 4 as expected, and the effective entropy of the second situation is 2.03, so it's gone down. And that's expected because the third and fourth species, and even the, and, and the second species, are much more rare, and the first species is dominating now. But when the third and fourth species go extinct, as described by the vector v3, you've got the effective entropy being only 1.64. So you can see that the drop from the first and second situation was almost 2, but the drop between the second and the third situation was only about 0.4. So this is a bit of a problem because if the third and fourth species go extinct in the second situation, you'd expect a very big drop in the diversity. And this is especially true if, let's say, the situation for V2 involved a large number of species. So even though the third and the fourth species are not common, they could still be fairly large in absolute number. And I'll actually mention this point later. But there's, another, there's a solution to this. And there's another diversity measure called root diversity. And it's defined by the following equation. Well, first you take the sum over the square root of all the PIs and then you square that entire number. So this is kind of a compromise. It's kind of Shannon entropy, but not really. 
And you can see that if you use this new root diversity measure, uh, you can compare it with the Shannon, effective Shannon entropy measure on the three previous situations. And now with the root diversity, the drop from the first to the second situation is about 1.3, whereas the drop from the second situation to the third situation is actually almost 2. So this root diversity better captures the loss of diversity from the second to the third situation relative to the first to the second situation. And you can see if you plot the Shannon effective versus root diversity on a graph for a situation where you just have two species, so it's now a function of a single variable, you see that the root diversity is a little more flat around the equally distributed point of p equals 0.5, and it drops off more steeply as the probability approaches 0 or 1. So you can think of the root diversity as a kind of correction to the Shannon diversity, where the root diversity really is more sensitive in the extreme regions when species are about to go extinct. So what are the limitations of all these diversity measures? I've talked a bit about the different diversity measures that exist in the literature, but of course there are some limitations to this entire approach. The first is that the measures only use proportions, and that's a very important point because you might want to take into account absolute numbers as well. I mean, in real life, some populations of creatures exist in very restricted ranges, and they don't have a very high proportion. But nevertheless, the, those populations can still be stable, and they could be quite different from the other species as well. So just using proportions is somewhat limiting in terms of understanding biological diversity. Another problem is that these measures are too easily applied at the species level. So why did we even apply these measures at the species, species level? You know, species units are somewhat arbitrary, and sometimes one species can be split off into two very similar species, and that will just arbitrarily increase the biological diversity. Maybe it makes more sense to measure biological diversity at different levels and take into account the genetic differences between the different species as well. Of course, that requires more data. And then once you have that data, you can go back and apply these same principles to that data. But the problem is, if you create a measure, it will just be too simply applied sometimes. So there is a little bit of a, a social responsibility here in that we should not just create measures and advertise them or call them diversity measures, and then just let people run willy-nilly with them and apply them to any random situation where they can easily try and measure things. And people will go around saying, well, this region is more diverse than another region just because this Ginny Simpson effective root index or something or other tells you that it's more diverse. No, I think a single number can never really capture the harmoniously functioning ecosystem. You really have to understand a little bit more about an ecosystem than just a single number. A single number can give you a rough approximation, it can help you create graphs, but a single number can never really tell you whether an ecosystem is healthy or unhealthy, or whether a diversity loss is a true loss, or whether it's just an artifact of the mathematics. So I think we have to be really careful. These diversity indices are interesting and, you know, they're an interesting mathematical exercise, but their utility is quite limited. In reality, we have to really understand the ecosystem and not just treat it as some kind of abstract system. Because if we continue to treat ecosystems as an abstract system, then we're never really going to understand how to treat them respectfully. And that goes into my final moral, and that's that you can use mathematics to quantify a problem but you must still go beyond the mathematics and connect with nature on a personal level in order to gain a basic understanding of the complexity of nature. So I hope you found this presentation interesting, and I hope to see you again next time.